This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. One group of animals seems to universally unite people, no matter whom they are. I'm talking about cephalopods. Everyone has a favorite. I'm sure that you do. From the color-changing octopus to the multi-chambered nautilus, everyone has a question about these smart, colorful undersea creatures. How do they move? How do they change shape and color? How intelligent are they? Because we know they are really smart. And how do researchers study these animals? Or what is your favorite and why? Please tell us. So we decided to vote to so we decided to devote some special time to dive in to your squid and cuttlefish questions and talk about some of the latest CEF research. It's time for Ask a Cephalopod Scientist. Our guide through this cephalopod celebration is Dr. Sarah McAnulty. She's a squid biologist and assistant research professor at the University of Connecticut in Stores. She's also executive director of Skype, a scientist, and a tireless tweeter about her favorite friends. Welcome to Science Friday. Thanks so much for having me. Just a note that this interview is recorded in front of a live Zoom audience because we want listeners to be part of these interviews and we want to answer your questions. So please, as I say, don't be shy. Sarah, you recently graduated from your PhD program. Congratulations. Thank you so much. How did you become so interested in, I think, falling in love with cephalopod? I have been interested in biology broadly since I was a little kid. I first started as being interested in dinosaurs. And then um, I went to the library with my mom all the time when I was uh, young in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. And one day we checked out a uh, videotape all about the ocean. And about halfway through, Twilight Zone music started playing <laughs> and they introduced uh, the cuttlefish. And they were doing this really amazing behavior called passing cloud. I didn't know that was what it was called at the time, but effectively it looks like a hypnotic wheel is passing over the cuttlefish's body. And I thought that was the wildest thing I had ever seen. And I was pretty much hooked on cephalopods from that moment on. Yeah, would you call yourself a cephalopod fangirl? I suppose fan woman at this point, perhaps, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not how they say it, but you're absolutely right. Would be fan woman. Um, you study the Hawaiian bobtail squid. Why focus on, on that squid? It's a great question. So the Hawaiian bobtail squid is really phenomenal, specifically for studying how animals and bacteria have these beneficial relationships with each other, these, these successful communications that we have in our body too. So we have, of course, bacteria on our skin, in our gut, and they're totally essential for our health. The nice thing about the bobtail squid is that they have just one species of bacteria in these specialized organs on their underside called the light organ. And so those bacteria produce light that allow the squid to camouflage with moonlight coming down from above. Now, my work covers basically how the immune system can tell the difference between beneficial bacteria and all the other bacteria that squid may encounter in the seawater. That's cool. Uh, what are some of the big questions that you have still left over? You've been studying these bobtail squid for quite a while. What don't you know yet that you got to know? One of the things we really want to know, um, specifically with the female bobtail squid, is how they can pick out the um, consortium of bacteria that they'll eventually have as an adult in what's called an ANG. That's short for accessory nidimental gland. And now this is a super cool organ also associated with bacteria. Imagine like a pile of spaghetti and each spaghetti strand has a different species of bacteria inside of it. When the female squid go to lay her eggs, she'll wrap the baby squid in coats of jelly that if you cut it in half, looks a lot like an onion. And so each huh. jelly layer has a bunch of bacteria all in that jelly. And so she'll lay her eggs, and unlike an octopus that constantly cleans her eggs, she'll just leave them under a coral bit or a rock and go swim away to lay another clutch another day. So the bacteria in the egg protect the baby squid from bacteria, fungus, and potentially other things in the water as well. And so we want to know basically what compounds or what chemicals are the bacteria creating to protect the squid? And how does the female squid, when she's uh, first developing as a little baby squid, how does she pick out the right bacteria? Because there may be like a hundred different species in there, but there's way more than a hundred species in her environment. So how the heck is she picking the right stuff? 
that's why she's there and we're here. That's exactly She knows right. how to do that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, we, we have calls. We have uh, viewers coming in who have some questions. Let's go to uh, our, our first question. Let's go to Lean, Linda Keenan. And she asks, are, those, are there other sea creatures who communicate or signal by changing their skin color and shape the way octopuses do? Ooh, that is a great question. That is a great question. So cephalopods are not the only animals that change color. Um, fish change color all the time, but not quite as quickly as, uh, as cephalopods do. So I personally know much, much more about communication between uh, cephalopod species than fish, for example. Um, but it's possible fish do it. I know fish definitely change at night. Um, they'll go from being maybe brightly colored on the reef to these more um, light and dark patterns because it's more easy to camouflage when you have uh, light and dark patterns at night. So that's one way. It's not so much communication, it's hiding, um, but reef fish do it every night. There is another question that came up earlier that I'm, I'm glad you're on because I really wanted to know the answer to this. Earlier this month, scientists used CRISPR. Uh, to make the first genetic altered squid. Why is that such a big deal? What is so exciting about being able to do that? This is truly huge because a lot of times um, in cephalopod research, in, in the research that I've done and many others have done, we get kind of to this wall of understanding where you really need to start playing with the genetics of the animal that you're studying to really piece out the mechanism of how things are happening. And so the one challenge with squid is that they're really rubbery, honestly. And so um, when you're playing with CRISPR, often what you have to do is take a very, very tiny needle and inject it into a little squid embryo. And so when it comes to some cells, they're very easy to puncture. And with the squid, it's like trying, it's just like the needle sometimes would just bend when you would try to poke the squid. Um, and so it was a collection of uh, challenges, including raising the squid in captivity, that have all kind of come together at the Marine Biological Laboratory to just overcome these obstacles and make a genetically modified squid happen. And now that we can do it in the market squid up in Massachusetts, we can hopefully do it in a whole bunch of other species as well, so that we can understand specifically what genes are playing around um, with communication of bacteria and, and animals or other questions as well. Have you in your own laboratory done this needle thing? Trying to I, I did how, hard, how hard is that? You break needles trying to do it? I broke all kinds of things. It was <laughs> so hard. Yeah, so I, I did a workshop um, with Judith Pangnor, uh, who is, is another uh, scientist who works on this kind of thing. And she um, had us basically like taking teeny, teeny, tiny scissors and snipping part of the egg in order to get the needle in. And so we used this bright green dye to inject so we could see whether it worked or not. And wow, yeah, it was uh, easier said than done for sure. Took a very oh, steady hand. Wow, I couldn't do that. That's why I'm sitting here and you're sitting over there. Right. Uh, let's, let's, go to, let's go to our next uh, listener. Terry Kirby Hathaway in Outer Banks, North Carolina has a question for you. I do. Thank you for calling on me. And I want to say I love your Twitter feed. I'm one of your followers on Twitter. So I was excited to see you on here. My question is about your bobtail squid. Uh, is the bacteria that produces, that produce the light for the bobtail squid, is it the same as the bacteria that produces the light in flashlight fishes? That's a great question. Um, yes. So the, the bacteria that we're talking about is Vibrio fisheri, and it shows up in a lot of different places, in the lure of angler fishes, in pine cone fish, in those little under eye areas. Um, so yeah, it, it shows up in a lot of different animals. It's a slightly different strain. So if you took the bacteria out of the pine cone fish and you tried to put it in a squid, it doesn't go so well. If you took the angler fish bacteria out, it again, doesn't really jive with the, with the squid, but um, it's the same species. Great answer, thank you. Thanks for calling. Thanks for getting, you're the first person on our Zoom call ever. So we'll, we'll put a little bit of trivia on our website about that. Uh, let's go to another question. Greg Miller, hi, welcome to Science Friday. Uh, hi, um, I, I, I think 
uh, cephalopods are absolutely brilliant, very intelligent, and I just wanted to know how you test uh, cephalopod intelligence. Another excellent question. So um, I recommend that everybody read this book called Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Um, and the answer is barely. So it's really, really hard to compare different animal intelligences because what um, one animal needs to get by can be very, very different from what another animal needs. So for example, if a squid looked at us and saw that we couldn't change color at all, they might think that we're not very smart at all, even though we can talk to each other with words and they don't hear that well at all. And so you really have to think about what is intelligence to this animal's lifestyle and how do you compare one animal to another when those lifestyles are so, so different. So we might think that a bacterium, for example, is not particularly intelligent, but they can do things that we could never do. And so um, that, that question, so I'm not just trying to like uh, send the question right back to you, but in determining animal intelligence in terms of like a quantitative, this animal is smarter than this animal is really tough. Um, but you can test uh, kind of what they're capable of doing in terms of problem solving. You can give them uh, association tests, mazes, um, trying to recognize themselves. These are common things that um, animal behaviorists use to try to figure out uh, what they're capable of. Do they have a, a brain like we do? I mean, because they normally, you know, some of these fish don't have them or some of the animals that live in the ocean don't have these big brains like we do. They do have brains and they're quite large. And also, fun fact, they're uh, donut shaped, which is one of my favorite squid facts of all time. <laughs> their esophagus goes through their brain. And so they have to eat very small little bits because if they were to take a huge chunk, like it would squeeze their brain, which is... Uh, Ha can't be comfortable, but they have one central brain, and then octopuses have ganglion, which are like collections of neurons that are not quite a brain, um, but still a collection that is capable of doing some stuff. And those are each in the arms. So it's kind of like they have eight or nine rather brains, the central oh. brain, and then the eight brains in the arms. A donut brain. That must be the Homer Simpson of cephalopods to exactly. have that donut brain. I, I want to talk more about some of these really interesting species. There's something called the strawberry squid that has two different sized eyes by, on purpose? Yes. The, yeah, the strawberry squid is one of my favorite squid species because it can really show you how different cephalopods can be from one another. Cephalopods have been on Earth for 500 million years. That's longer than trees, that's longer than sharks. They've had a lot of time to evolve these really wild adaptations. And the strawberry squid is a phenomenal example. Um, for those of us in the Zoom call, I've made a doodle of the strawberry squid for today. So we've got <laughs> two different great. eyes here um, that are for two different purposes. So uh, facing toward the surface of the water, the strawberry squid has this big bulbous yellow eye that you see here. And so while it's looking up, that yellow color is filtering out uh, different wavelengths or colors. And so it helps the squid differentiate between uh, counter illumination, so animals that um, are using color or light to kind of disappear among uh, the light coming down from above, which is super, super faint because they're super deep. And so there's really not much light to work with. And you need a huge eye to pick up all the light you can. And then the eye that they tilt downward is much smaller and is specifically used for detecting, we think like bioluminescence down where they live. And so maybe the small eye is used to detect food for that night, whereas the bigger eye is looking up to make sure there's no predators coming from above. And on top of that, they also are covered in what's called photophores, which are bioluminescent organs all over what's called their mantle or their body, basically. Wow, is that cool? In case you're just joining us, I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. We're talking with, uh, we're talking with Dr. Sarah McAnulty, newly minted PhD, Dr. McAnulty. She's a squid biologist, assistant professor at the University of Connecticut, and uh, the ultimate squid geek, I think, that I've ever, I've ever met. She has this great squid uh, 
air about her. I mean, do you, do you live and breathe squid even when you're not in the laboratory? Do you talk about it incessantly and get I, I try people to, crazy? Uh, yeah, I try to give my uh, personal friends a break from squid uh, just so that I can maintain <laughs> friendships. But um, yeah, even uh, my car is called the Squid Mobile and it has a phone number on the back that you can text for a squid fact as long as you're not driving. Oh, wow. Send us a, send us a photo of that. We'd like, we'd like to right. spread that around. Uh, let's, go to, uh, let's go to our next listener, Alina Stewart. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hey, Ira. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I was wondering um, about differences or similarities between how different cephalopod species use light and color to communicate. Cool. So um, there's a lot to work with here. So, all right, we've got a couple different ways that they go about this. First of all, you have their color change that we can see, which is uh, used they use their chromatophores to do that. So those are those like little color changing cells that expand and contract. Uh, to show the color. And so, for example, we've got the Caribbean reef squid that lives pretty much from Florida on down quite a while. Um, and they will signal to each other effectively whether they're friendly or aggressive. And so um, when a mating pair gets together, the male and female will hang out for quite a while. And they can really get precise and who they're talking to. So for example, the female will have this sort of brownish color on, that's her like friendly pattern, and the male will split his pattern down the middle of his body so that he's showing a friendly pattern toward his mate, but an aggressive pattern, like a white color, to everybody else around to kind of indicate to the males in his area that uh, they should back off. And so there's this one video that you should uh, go on YouTube and look for, um, where the male and female are swimming together and the male changes the side of the female that he's on. And right as he's behind her, he switches the colors from one side to the other. So you can really see that he wants her to know that he likes her um, and wants to, everybody else to know that they should swim elsewhere. Um, but that's not it. So we've got the color camouflage. That's one, or uh, communication, that's one form. But something that we don't understand quite as well is what's called polarized light. And so your colors have a wavelength, that's the color that we see, but the polarization is kind of think of as the angle that the light is coming from. And that's not something that our eyes can pick up, but cephalopods can see the polarization of light and they can use uh, structures on their back to control what angle the light is coming from. And they can put patterns on their back that we think they're using specifically to communicate with each other that we can't see. So there's still work to be done there, but that's super cool. And then light is the, a whole other can of worms um, that mostly animals deeper down um, are using, partially to impress uh, potential mates and also to hide or confuse prey. Now, it, it just struck me, you reminded me that one of the first videos we ever made uh, 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 Flora Lichtman, who was our video producer back years ago, she did a video called Where's the Octopus, which has now gotten over a million views. And the octopus was, I, I can't think of the scientist's name, Roger, you probably Roger know. Hanlon. Roger Rod, Hanlon. Rod, thank you. I knew yeah. you would know. Roger Hanlon stumbled upon this octopus as he was swimming underwater and he sort of gasped. And there it was, because it would look just like a rock sitting on the surface, uh, sitting on the floor, and it picked itself up and it, it could camouflage itself with whatever it came on to, and you could not find, uh, do cuttlefish do that the same way or do all cephalopods have a different method of camouflage? It's all, so some cephalopods, there's overlapping skills that not everybody has. So octopuses and cuttlefish are both incredibly good at color change and shape change. The octopuses being the maximum shape changers because they don't have any big hard structures in their bodies that they have to deal with. So there are structures in cuttlefish and octopus skin called papillae, which basically allow flat skin to raise up. One of the most impressive species that does this is the giant Australian cuttlefish, Sepia apama. They basically look like they're growing eyebrows sometimes. It's wild to watch. And so um, really, really big protrusions can come off their skin. And just when they, as, qu as quickly as they can think, they can put those little spikes up or flatten them down. 
And that really helps when you're trying to look like an algae covered piece of rock or coral uh, or what have you. Um, squid are not as, uh, they don't have as many papillae to work with basically. Mm. I'm looking out there, I see uh, Linda Keenan on our Zoom has a question. Hi, Linda. She's from Silver Spring, Maryland. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sure yes. can. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. I wanted to know if squid swim more or less at the same depth, or do they swim very far up or down in search of prey? It depends on the species. So the Hawaiian bobtail squid that I work with, I mean, we can catch those squid in ankle depth water. Um, we'll go out at night on sand flats in Hawaii and um, they'll be all over the place and during the day they just bury in the sand where they are. You can find them at 30 meters depth sometimes or ankle depth. Now um, the market squid that you may have consumed in calamari at some point, I know calamari is having a real moment right now because of Rhode Island's uh, recent uh, push for everybody to eat more calamari. Um, they will basically over the night and day cycle at night, a lot of plankton and other animals will go toward the surface of the water and the squid will follow them up because that's where the food is. And then during the day, sink again. And so um, there are some squid that follow that pattern, some that stay deep all the time, some that stay shallow all the time. You know, you're so close to squid in your laboratory and you were so fond of them. Is it painful at all to talk about calamari, about eating them, you know? It it used to be, but I have to remember that we have to think of the whole ecosystem when we're thinking about how to feed humans. And so calamari compared to fish is a more sustainable seafood because squid can reproduce so quickly. So if you're thinking about sustainable seafood, um, squid, generally speaking, are a better choice than a fish that may take you know, 30 years to become sexually mature. This may change, uh, but for now, Squid are a better choice than fish for sustainability. Okay, let's go back out to Zoom to Annette Waglinski from St. Petersburg, Florida. Hi, Annette. Hi, thanks for having me. I am fascinated by the strawberry squid's eyes being different sizes. And my question is, how did they evolve? And do we see this anywhere else? Oh, that's a good question. How did that evolve? I don't know. Sometimes the wildest stuff comes up in evolution that um, you just kind of marvel at. I, it was super helpful for them. Um, it must have been uh, beneficial at some point in evolution. I can't think of another animal that has two different sized eyes, but if you gave me an hour to think on it, I might be able to come <laughs> up with something. Um, Ira, can you think of anything that has two different kinds of eyes? Uh, I'll keep my relatives out of this, but no, that's, uh, that, I really can't, uh, can't think of anything. That is a really at the moment. question. Yeah. You know, uh, symmetry is, is really big in nature, isn't it? I mean, yeah. even in physics, they talk about supersymmetry, a symmetry in animal kingdom. It's the straight down the middle. Uh, let's go to another study that was out earlier this year where researchers made, now this sounds wild, 3D glasses. They made 3D yes. glasses for cuttlefish. Tell us about that. This was one of the cutest things I've ever seen in my life. A cuttlefish, with, it truly looks like the 1980s, like 3D glasses, one blue, one red um, eyeglass just stuck onto a cuttlefish. So um, the reason the scientists were, were putting 3D glasses on a cuttlefish is they really wanted to know um, how they're doing depth perception. Because we know that cuttlefish need to see their prey I need to be super precise in how they strike their prey. If you watch a cuttlefish eat, they kind of will uh, put all of their arms into a point and the tentacles, which are the parts that actually grab the food, will be in the middle and slowly eking out. And then all of a sudden in a, in a flash will snap out and grab the prey. So they need to be really good at knowing how far out to throw those tentacles. And so um, they wanted to see how that depth perception works. And it turns out it works very similar to the way we do. It has stereopsis or stereo vision, um, which really involves a lot of brain eye coordination and power. Um, they also did uh, a study beforehand on uh, mantis shrimp, which are also a really interesting animal um, in terms of vision because they can see 
I think they have 16 types of uh, cones which detect color compared to us, they only have three. So the mantis shrimp are another really interesting species for vision. Yeah, I used to have one in my aquarium. Really? Uh, yeah, they would. That's awesome. Yeah, they were very loud. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk. Uh, let's go out to, uh, to back out to Zoom to Ann Papa. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. It's P Papa, I think. I'm sorry. So yeah, it's it's a real Science Friday. I messed up somebody's name, so we know it's a it's it's right. Papa. It's Papa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> go for it. Um, I recently saw a picture of an octopus that was the size of a fingernail, and I was wondering for cuttlefish, what's the smallest cuttlefish and what's the largest cuttlefish? Ooh. What's the smallest cuttlefish? I know the smallest squid. Uh, the biggest cuttlefish, without a doubt, is the giant uh, Australian cuttlefish. They can be um, a meter long in mantle length, which is huge. Um, one of my bucket list items is to go to Australia in um, early summer, late spring, um, our time. It's, I guess, winter their time. Um, and, and check out that mating aggregation because it's really apparently stunning. Um, the smallest cuttlefish, I know there's a dwarf cuttlefish, but I can't promise that it's actually the smallest. Um, but can I tell you about pygmy squid? Because no one's going to stop one. you. Go ahead. Great. Okay. So pygmy squid are super, super tiny. They're about the length of your pinky fingernail. They're like 16 millimeters long. And they are fantastic and amazing. But we've only really recently realized how cool they are behaviorally. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about that. They have the ability to uh, create sticky, su this sticky substance that's on their back and then stick to a blade of seagrass. And it's, I kind of like to call them the post-it notes of the sea because they just look like a little goofy squid stuck onto the top to a piece of uh, seagrass. And then they pivot their little faces around to look for food and it is really cool. And on top of that, they also use their ink in a really peculiar, awesome way. They will squirt out a little blob of ink and then hide behind that ink from their prey and then quickly jump through the ink and attack their prey. So they're basically creating a hunting blind with their ink, which is wild and so cool. That is cool. That is cool. Uh, how has the pandemic affected you and other cephalopod researchers? Has it had an effect? Yes, uh, it's been tough, but um, I mean, it's been tough for all scientists. Anybody working with animals uh, is really sort of stuck because uh, if we can't go into the lab every, every day to take care of them, um, it sort of creates a problem. The one um, benefit of working with Hawaiian bobtail squid is that their lifespans aren't all that long. And so um, for an animal that may only live about five months in the lab, um, we were luckily right at the end of uh, kind of a squid cohort. So we wrapped up that cohort and then just didn't get any more squid. I was um, going to go back to Hawaii to collect in June, but um, that was unsafe. So we didn't go. I um, am theoretically supposed to go in January, but I kind of doubt that that's going to happen either. Um, so we have to just cross our fingers that um, everyone gets healthy again so that we can uh, hit the ground running. Speaking of healthy, what about all the squid and all the cephalopods in everybody's lab during the pandemic? That they, they, did they leave them there? Are they okay? What happened? I know the ones at the MBL are being taken care of just as normal. So because the scientists weren't going into the lab as often, um, they didn't breed as many cephalopods to be uh, studied. So there's just sort of like a pared down um, family of cephalopods there. There are still all the species that they had before, I think, um, but uh, Brett Grassi and Taylor Sackmar just didn't breed up as many. So it's like a, a calmer hmm. kind of thing there going on right now. You know, you know, you reminded me of a few years ago, there was a new uh, octopus a cute little octopus that we tried, I, I think we talked to you about it, to, called the Dorabilis. Oh uh, my goodness, yes. Whatever, did they, we tried to get it named because it was so adorable. Whatever happened, did it, did it, did it work? That's a good question. I mean, I know there are a lot of cephalopod uh, researchers who call it a Dorabilis still. Um, I know Brett is one of them and, and I think of it as a Dorabilis as well. Uh, I don't know what the official like names on the books Oh, that was so cute. But it is cute it's as heck, yeah. Cute little octopus. Um, you know, we have run out of time. 
I can't believe it. It's gone by so quickly. Uh, I want to thank you, Sarah, for taking so much time to be with us today. Absolutely terrific on our first Zoom meeting, and uh, you've inaugurated it for us, and hopefully we'll have many more of them. Dr. Sarah McAnulty is a squid biologist and assistant research professor, University of Connecticut in stores. She's also executive, she's also executive director of Skype a Scientist. And you can watch the entire video of this interview and sign up to find out about sitting on and uh, joining us on future Zoom interviews on our website. It's there at sciencefriday.com slash events. Charles Berquist is our director. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, Katie Feather, and Kathleen Davis. We had technical and engineering help today from a whole bunch of people and uh, who made it possible. BJ Liederman composed our theme music. And if you missed any part of our program or you'd like to hear it again, yes, subscribe to our podcast. And you can ask your smart speaker also to play Science Friday. And you can leave us a suggestion on our Science Friday Vox Pop app, anything you'd like to hear us to to do for you. What, what kinds of stories would you like us to hear? That's on the Science Friday Box Pop app, wherever you get your apps. Of course, this is the old fashioned way to talk to us. You can email us too at scifry at sciencefriday.com. Thank you all, everybody out there. 100 folks joined in on our Zoom meeting today. We're so happy to see all of you. We'll see you next time on Zoom. Have a great weekend. I'm Ira Flato. <laughs>